name is Karen Smith. I'm a professor of international relations at the LSE, and I'm also head of department. I'm Teresa Squatrito, and I'm an assistant professor of international relations at the LSE. So my core research area is the international relations of the European Union. I'm interested in how the European Union engages with the rest of the world. I'm particularly interested in the extent to which the EU pursues so-called ethical policies, such as the promotion of human rights and democracy worldwide. I've done a lot of work on European responses to genocide. And uh, more recently, I've done a lot of work on European Union diplomacy at the United Nations. I got in, into this area a very long time ago, um, in the beginning of the 1990s, when I was working uh, as a freelance editor and journalist in Italy, uh, and I was working on the single European market. But at the same time, I was noticing the negotiations that were happening on the Maastricht Treaty. And part of the Maastricht Treaty sets up what's called the common foreign policy, and I found this development quite fascinating. I had studied international relations before and a key tenet of international relations or a key belief of international many international relations theorists at least is that say state sovereignty is sort of sacrosanct and states would never uh, integrate on a core um, area such as foreign policy and yet it, what i was seeing was that the European, member, Euro, European Union member states were increasingly willing to do a lot more in terms of cooperation on foreign policy so I ditched the whole uh, journalism thing and I went uh, and did a PhD on EU foreign policy, the cooperation on EU policy towards Central and Eastern uh, Europe. And then you know, my career developed from there. So I study international institutions. And for me, this includes international organizations like the United Nations, the WTO, the European Union. Um, so some of the big well-known institutions, but I um, also look at institutions that are lesser known, um, including the Commonwealth Secretariat or the East African community or the Caribbean community. And in looking at uh, these institutions, I also have paid attention to international courts as a particular type of international institution. And across um, international institutions, I'm interested in three kind of main aspects of them. The first is concerns around their legitimacy. This has become especially important as a lot of them kind of faced what some people call a legitimacy crisis. Um, I'm interested in their performance and how, how they do what they do and what they do, um, as well as their design. So what institutional features do they have? And generally, I try to connect these three aspects to see, for example, whether or not their design has an impact on their performance or whether or not uh, their performance has an impact on their legitimacy. So I came about this line of research I think indirectly because I, as an American, I always thought of courts as political institutions. I think that's very common in everyday kind of political thought about courts in the US. Um, and so that inspired me to think about the extent to which other courts outside the US, in particular international courts, are also political institutions. So that led me to my dissert my my PhD work and, and eventually my dissertation, which looked at the European Court of Human Rights and the European Court of Justice. In doing that, then I became more familiar with the broader institutions that those courts are embedded within. Um, and I also was noting that a lot of the times the research on each of these institutions was derived from only kind of people studying them in insulation of one another. So they would only study the European Court of Justice or they'd only study the European Court of Human Rights or only the UN or only the EU. And I was kind of inspired to think, well, what can we learn about these institutions by comparing them? So overall, my research also really places emphasis on learning about international institutions through the process of comparison.
So my research has um, been of interest uh, to policymakers and observers. Um, the work that I did on European responses to genocide, for example, led to me being appointed a co-chair of a task force on EU prevention of mass atrocities approximately 10 years ago. Uh, and we produced a report with recommendations on how the EU could improve um, or strengthen uh, its activities to try to prevent uh, mass atrocities worldwide. More recently, I've done work on European and other group diplomacy at the United Nations. I did this together with a longtime collaborator in New York. And what we did was we showed that contrary to a lot of popular belief that the only thing that matters at the United Nations are states, we showed that actually diplomats work not just as sort of national diplomats, but they also seek to work within other groups such as the European Union or the African Union or groups that are known as sort of um, the friends of, uh, sort of friends of the responsibility to protect uh, and so on. And this kind of group diplomacy is a very important aspect of um, diplomacy at the United Nations. Uh, so that work is will be of interest uh, to scholars, students, but also observers and possibly diplomats uh, at the United Nations so they know what they're getting into uh, when they're posted to New York or uh, Geneva uh, and so on. So I think my research is um, useful and beneficial for policymakers. So I have done a lot of work on understanding the design of international institutions and in particular that's two, it comes in two, two um, ways. So the first is in terms of design relating to the rules about how international institutions allow civil society actors like NGOs, um, experts, or whatnot to engage with and participate in international governance processes. In that capacity, I've held conversations or been in dialogue with some international institutions or their staff. So this would include the WTO, as well as the Commonwealth, as they've tried to rethink and potentially reform their policies around access for civil society actors. The other aspect I think that has been quite important for policymakers comes in my work on international courts, where I have also studied their design, so features that relate to their access for civil society, but also things like the institutional safeguards to independence. Um, in this capacity, I've had the opportunity to spend some time in dialogues with policymakers who are working on formulating a new international court um, in the area of international investment law. The International Institutions Law and Ethics Cluster uh, is uh, one of the core clusters in the International Relations Department. It brings together faculty members, including fellows and postdocs as well as PhD students who are interested in international institutions, international law, and international ethics. And uh, both, both Teresa and I have been co-chairs, not at the same time, not overlapping, but we've both been co-chairs of the cluster in the past. Um, so we have a pretty good overview of the kind of research that is presented both by us um, uh, and other faculty members, as well as by outside speakers. Yes, so I think we've had a pretty wide range of research, which I think actually reflects the content of, of the cluster overall. And that is we've had people that explore and look at international institutions in their, in their more formalized form or international law in its more formalized form where, where it's like codified. Um, so we've had people that have um, spoken about security cooperation through NATO and through um, ASEAN. We've had people that have spoken about the role of new informal institutions, maybe something like the G7, which plays an active role in structuring international policy or interactions between states. We've had people that have looked at Paris Agreement and, and environmental governance um, or climate change cooperation and how that's manifesting in state policy or not. So we've had people that have presented on a whole range of issues but I think at the core of all of this is it's starting from the premise that international institutions, law and ethics matter 
Um, and then thinking about and asking how it matters, when it matters. Um, and I think this illustrates a real kind of evolution of, of the development of the literature or of the field of international relations. Because if we go back, um, there was a very long, you know, a, a point in time in which they were international institutions or law was dismissed as even being relevant. Um, and so I think where we are today is, is um, and what the cluster really has looked at is all the ways in which international institutions and ethics actually have an impact. I was just thinking that one of the more recent um, presentations that um, that uh, took place at the cluster, one of the cluster workshops was in fact on global health um, and global health cooperation. Uh, and of course, one of the reasons why we're talking to each other on Zoom uh, is because of this global uh, pandemic that has uh, uh, confined us all to our our, uh, our four walls uh, for, for quite a long time. So, um, uh, but even in terms of, you know, thinking about, you know, cooperation on global health, there's been a lot of criticism of the World Health Organization, but without it and without things like COVAX, you know, so this sort of international, att this attempt to, um, uh, to get vaccines to poorer countries, I mean, where would we be? I think that part of what has come out of the cluster um, is, is, and the broader literature is understanding um, that international institutions are actors often in their own right. So I know that's a lot of what your work has basically been on is thinking about how the EU is an international actor. Um, and, and that resonates exactly with the thing like the World Health Organization. And we've all seen it in, in, in throughout the, the, the pandemic that we, you know, I mean, it was images we saw, like we can all see the, the media conference room, right? And so that all, all of a sudden that, that, that gives a sense of a persona behind this, this institution. And I think that's a big part of what some of us are working on is thinking about them as, as actors in their own right. And also as potential means by which problems can be addressed or, or potentially solved. And I think that's the other kind of thing that unites a lot of a lot of us is seeing international institutions or international law as perhaps means or forums for addressing global problems, whether it be the pandemic or a financial crisis or, um, you know, human rights violations or whatever.